Chapter Sixteen of Nothing of Importance by Bernard Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wounded. Lance Corporal Allen was killed on Tuesday, the sixth of June. For the rest of that day, I was all on edge. I wondered sometimes how I could go on. Even in billets I dreamed of rifle grenades, and though I had only returned from leave a fortnight ago, I felt as tired out in body and mind as I did before I went. And this last horror did not add to my peace of mind. I very nearly quarrelled with Captain Wetherell, the battalion Lewis gun officer, over the position of a Lewis gun. There had been a change of company front, and some readjustments had to be made. I believe I told him he had not got the remotest idea of our defence scheme, or something of that sort. My nerves were all jangled, and my brain would not rest a second. We were nearly all like that at times. I decided, therefore, to go out again to-night with our wires. I had been out last night, and Owen was going to-night, but I wanted to be doing something to occupy my thoughts. I knew I should not sleep. At a quarter to ten I sent word to Corporal Dyson, the wiring corporal, to take his men up at eleven instead of ten, as the moon had not quite set. At eleven o'clock Owen and I were out in no man's land, putting out concertina wire between 80A and 81A bombing posts, which had recently been connected up by a deep narrow trench. There was what might be called a concertina craze on. Innumerable coils of barbed wire were converted into concertinas by the simple process of winding them round and round seven upright stakes in the ground. Every new lap of wire was fastened to the one below it at every other stake by a twist of plain wire. The result, when you came to the end of a coil and lifted the hole up off the stakes, was a heavy ring of barbed wire that concertinaed out into ten-yard lengths. They were easily made up in the trench, quickly put up, and when put out in two parallel rows, about a yard apart, and joined together with plenty of barbed wire tangled loosely, were as good an obstacle as could be made. We had some thirty of these to put out to-night. When you are out wiring you forget all about being in no man's land, unless the Germans are sniping across. The work is one that absorbs all your interest, and your one concern is to get the job done quickly and well. I really cannot remember whether the enemy had been sniping or not. I use the word sniping to denote firing occasional shots across with fixed rifles sighted by day. I remember that I forgot all about Captain Wetherell and his Lewis gun positions as soon as I was outside the bombing post at 80A. There were about fifteen yards between this post and the crater edge, where I had a couple of A Company bombers out as a covering party. But in this fifteen yards were several huge shell-holes, and we were concealing the wire in these as much as possible. It was fascinating work, and I felt we could not get on fast enough with it. After a time I went along to Owen, whose party was working on my left. Here Corporal Dyson and four men were doing well also. All this strip of land between the trench and the crater edge was an extraordinary tangle of shell-holes, old beams and planks, and scraps of old wire. Every square yard of it had been churned and pounded to bits at different times by canisters and sausages and such like. Months ago there had been a trench along the crater edges, but new mines had altered these, and until we had dug the deep, narrow trench between 80A and 81A, about a fortnight ago, there had been no trench there for at least five months. The result was a chaotic jumble, and this jumble we were converting into an obstacle by judiciously placing concertina wiring. I repeat that I cannot remember if there had been much sniping across. I had just looked at my luminous watch, which reported ten past one when I noticed that the sky in the east began to show up a little paler than the German parapet across the crater. Dawn, I thought, already, there is no night at all, really. We must knock off in a quarter of an hour. The light will not be behind us, but half-past one will be time to stop. I was lying out by the bombers, gazing into the black of the crater. 
It was a warm night, and jolly, lying out like this, though a bit damp and muddy round the shell-holes. Then I got up, told Corporal Evans to come in after fixing the coil he was putting up, and was walking towards 80A post, when, bang, I heard from across the crater, and I felt a big sting in my left elbow, and a jar that numbed my whole arm. Ow! I cried involuntarily, and doubled the remaining few yards, and scrambled down into the trench. Corporal Dyson was there. Are you hit, sir? Yes, nothing much, here in the arm. Get the wirers in, it'll be light soon. Then somehow I found my equipment and tunic off. There seemed a lot of men round me, and I tried to realize that I was really hit. My arm hung numb and stiff, with the aftertaste of a sting in it. I felt this could not be a proper wound, as there was no real throbbing pain such as I expected. I was surprised when I saw a lot of blood in the half-light. Corporal Dyson asked me if I had a field dressing, and I said he would find one in the bottom right-hand corner of my tunic. To my annoyance he did not seem to hear, and used one of the men's. Then Owen appeared, with a serious, peering face. "'Are all the wirers in?' I asked. "'Yes,' he answered. "'How are you feeling?' His serious tone amused me. I wanted to say, "'Good heavens, man! I'm as fit as anything. I shall be back to-morrow, I expect.' But I felt very tired and rather out of breath as I answered, "'Oh, all right.' By this time my arm was bandaged, and I started walking back to Maple Redoubt, leaning on Corporal Dyson. I wanted to joke, but felt too tired. It seemed an interminable way down, especially along Watling Street. I had only once looked into the dressing station, although I must have passed it several hundred times. I was surprised at its size. There were two compartments. As I stepped down inside, I wondered if it were shell-proof. In the inner chamber I could hear the doctor's quick, low voice telling a man to move the lamp, and it seemed to flash across me for the first time that there ought to be some kind of guarantee against dressing stations being blown in like any ordinary dugout, and yet I knew there was no possibility of any such guarantee. "'Hello, Bill, old man,' said the little doctor, coming out quickly. "'Where's this thing of yours? In the arm, isn't it? Let's have a look.' Oh, yes, I see. He examined the bandage and the arm above it. Well, I won't be long. You won't mind waiting a few minutes, will you? I've got a bad case in here. Hall, get him to sit down and give him some bovril. And he was gone. No man could move or make men move quicker than the doctor. I felt apologetic. I had chosen a bad time to come, just when the doctor was busy with this other man. I asked who the fellow was, and learned he was a private from D Company. I was very grateful for the bovril. A good idea, this, I thought, having bovril ready for you. I waited about ten minutes, sitting on a chair. I listened to the movements and low voices inside. Turn him over. Here. No, those longer ones. Good heavens, didn't I tell you to get this changed yesterday? Now. That'll do. And so on. I turned my head round in silence, observing acutely every detail in this antechamber, as one does in a dentist's waiting-room. All the time in my arm I felt this numb wasp sting. I wondered when the real pain would start. There was no motion in this still smart. "'Now then, Bill,' said the doctor, "'so sorry to keep you. Let's have a look at it.' "'Oh, that's nothing very bad.' It smarted as he undid the bandage. I don't know what he did. I never looked at it. "'What sort of a one is it?' I asked. "'I could just do with one like this myself,' said the doctor. "'Is it a blighty one?' "'I'd give you a fiver for it any minute,' answered the doctor. "'I'm not certain whether the bone's broken or not, but I rather think it is touched. I can't say, though. A bullet, did you say? Are you sure?' "'Very sure,' I laughed. Well, it must be one of those explosive bullets. An ordinary bullet doesn't make a wound like yours. That's it. That'll do. I can't make out why there's not more pain, said I. Oh, that'll come later. You see, the shock paralyzes you at first. Here, take one of these. And he gave me a morphia tabloid. Cheero, Bill, he said, 
and I went out of the dugout leaning on a stretcher-bearer. Round my neck hung a label, the first of a long series. Gunshot wound in left forearm, it contained. I found later, question mark, fracture. 1.15 a.m. 7, 6, 16. Outside, Lewis was waiting with my trench kit. He had appeared a quarter of an hour back at the door of the dressing station, and had been told by the doctor so rapidly and forcibly that he ought to know that he would go with me to the clearing station, and that he had five minutes in which to get my kit together, that he had fairly sprinted away. Poor fellow! How should he know, seeing that he had been my servant over six months, and I had never got wounded before? But the doctor always made men double. As I passed our dugout, Edwards, Owen, Paul, and Nicholson were all standing outside. Cheero! I shouted. Good luck! The doctor says it's nothing much. I'll be back soon. What about that Lewis gun position? asked Edwards. Oh, I said, I want to keep that position on the left. Then I felt my decision waver. Still, if Wetherell wants the other, I don't know. All right, I'll fix up with Wetherell. Good luck. Hope you get to Blighty." I wanted to say such a lot. I wanted to say that I was sure to be back in a week or so. I wanted to think hard and decide about that Lewis gun. I wanted to send a message to Wetherell apologizing for what I had said. I wanted to talk to Sergeant Andrews, who was standing there too. But the stretcher-bearer was walking on, and I must go as he pleased. "'Good-bye, Sergeant Andrews!' I shouted. Last of all I saw Davies, standing solemn and dumb. "'Good-bye, Davies. Off to Blighty!' I could not see if he answered. The relentless stretcher-bearer led me on. Was I O.C. stretcher-bearers, or was I not? Why didn't I stop him? I had not decided about that Lewis gun. At the corner of Old Kent Road I was told I might as well sit on the ration trolley and go down on that and in the full light of dawn, about half-past two, I was rolled serenely down the hill to the citadel. "'Don't let go,' I said to the stretcher-bearer, who was holding the trolley back. I still thought of sending up a message about that Lewis gun position. Why could I not make up my mind? I looked back and saw Maple Redoubt receding further and further in the distance. "'By Jove!' I thought. "'I may not see it again for weeks.' and suddenly I realized that whether I made up my mind about the Lewis gun position or not would not make the slightest difference. "'Where do I go to now?' said I. "'There's an ambulance at the Citadel,' said the stretcher-bearer. "'You're quite right. You'll be in Haley in a little over an hour.' "'Haley? Why, this would be interesting,' I thought. And I should just go, and have nothing to decide. I should be passive. I was going right out of the arena, and the events of yesterday seemed a dream already. Wednesday. I lay in bed at the clearing station at Haley. It was just after nine o'clock the same morning, and the orderlies were out of sight, but not out of hearing, washing up the breakfast things. Half the dark blue blinds were drawn, as the June sun was blazing outside. I could see the glare of it on the cobbles in the courtyard, as the door opened and a cool, tall nurse entered. I closed my eyes and pretended to be asleep. I felt she might come and talk, and one thing I did not want to do, I did not want to talk. My body was most extraordinarily comfortable. I moved my feet toes up for the sheer joy of feeling the smooth sheets fall cool on my feet when I turned them sideways again. The pillow was comfortable. The whole bed was comfortable. Even my arm, that was throbbing violently now, and felt boiling hot, was very comfortably rested on another pillow. I just wanted to lie and lie. Only my mind was working so fast and hard that it seemed to make the skin tight over my forehead. And all the time there was that buzz buzzing. If I left off thinking, the buzzing took complete mastery of my brain. That was intolerable, so I had to keep on thinking. At the Citadel, an R.A.M.C. doctor had given me tea and a second label. He had also given me an injection against tetanus. This he did in the chest. 
Why didn't he do it in my right arm, I had thought. I would have rather had it there. Again, I had had to wait quite a quarter of an hour while he attended to the D Company private. I had learned from an orderly that this poor fellow was bound to lose a leg, and again I had felt that I was in the way here, that I was a bother. I had then watched the poor fellow carried out on a stretcher, and the stretcher slid into the ambulance. There was a seat inside, into which I was helped. Lewis had gone in front, very red-faced and awkward, and an R.A.M.C. orderly had got in behind me. Sitting, I had felt that he must think I was shamming. Then I remembered the first ambulance I had seen when I first walked from Chalkways to Bethune in early October. Was there really any connection between me then and me now? Then there had been a rather pleasant journey through unknown country, it seemed. After a few miles we halted and changed into another ambulance. As I had stood in the sunshine a moment, I had tried to make out where we were, but I could not recognize anything, and felt very tired. There was a white chalk road, a grass bank, and a house close by, that is all I could remember. And then there was another long ride, in which my one paramount idea was to rest my arm, which was in a white sling, and prevent it shaking and jarring. Then, at last, we had reached a village and pulled up in a big sunlit courtyard. Again, as I walked into a big room, I felt that people must think I was shamming. A matron had come in, and a doctor. Did I mind sitting and waiting a minute or so? Would I like some tea? I had refused tea. Then the doctor and an orderly came in, and the doctor asked some questions and took off my label. The orderly was taking off my boots, and the doctor had started helping. I had apologized profusely, for they were trench boots thick with mud. And then the doctor had asked me whether I could wait until about eleven before they looked at my arm. Meanwhile it would be better, as I should be more rested after a few hours in bed. Bed! I had never thought of going to bed for an arm at all. What a delicious idea! I felt so tired, too. I had not been to bed all night. Then I had been helped into this delightful bed, and after scrawling a letter home to go away by the eight o'clock post, I was glad I had remembered that, I had been left in peace at about half-past four. And here I was, I had had a cup of tea for breakfast, but did not want to eat anything. I wished I could go to sleep. Yet it was not much good now, if they were going to look at my arm at eleven. I opened my eyes whenever I was sure there was no one near me. Then I thought I might as well keep them open, otherwise they would think I had slept, and not know how tired out I felt. There was a man in the next bed with his head all bandaged, and round the bed in the corner was a screen. Opposite was an R.A.M.C. doctor, as far as I could gather. He was talking to the nurse, and looked perfectly well. I thought perhaps he might be the sort who would talk late when I wanted to sleep. He looked so well and lively. Suppose he had a gramophone and wanted to play it this afternoon. I should really have to complain if he did. Yet perhaps they would understand, and make him give it up because of us who were not so well. On my right, up at the other end of the room, was it a ward? Yes, I suppose it was were several voices, but I could not turn over and look at their owners, with my arm like this. How it throbbed and pulsed! Or was it aching? Suppose I got pins and needles in it! A khaki-clad padre came in. He just came over and asked me if I wanted anything, and did not worry me with talking. He had a very quiet voice and bald head. I liked both. I felt I ought to have wanted something. Had I been discourteous? The door opened, and the doctor entered, with another nurse and another doctor. Somehow this last person electrified everyone and everything. Who was he? His very walk was somehow different from the ordinary. My attention was riveted on him. Somehow I felt that he knew I was there, and yet he did not look at me. They wheeled a little table up from the other end of the room, laden with glasses and bottles and glittering little silver forks and things. I could not see clearly. An orderly was reprimanded by the nurse for something, in a subdued voice. There was a hush and a tenseness in this man's presence. 
yet he was calmly looking at a newspaper and sitting on an empty bed as he did so apparently kitchener was reported drowned in the north sea he spoke in a rich almost drawling voice he was immensely casual and yet one did not mind he walked over and washed his hands and put on some yellowy brown india rubber gloves that squelched in the basins and then he turned round and the other doctor whom i had seen at four o'clock and who already seemed a sort of confidential friend of mine in the presence of this master man asked him which case he wanted to see first and as he jerked his hand casually to one of the beds i was filled with a strange elation this was a surgeon i felt and one in whom i had immense confidence he would do the best for my arm he would make no mistakes i almost laughed for sheer joy he came at last to my bed and glanced at me he never smiled he asked me one or two questions i said i was question mark fracture that my arm was throbbing but felt numb more than anything i suppose we may presume there is a fracture said he at any rate there is no point in looking at it here i'll look at it under an anaesthetic he said to me not unkindly but still without a smile and a little later as he went out he half looked back at my bed eleven o'clock he said to the nurse as he went out the tension relaxed an orderly spoke in a bold ordinary voice the spell was gone out with the man who is that i asked the nurse oh that's mr bevan he's a very good surgeon indeed i know said i i can feel that about an hour later two orderlies whom i had not seen before came in with a stretcher and laid it on the floor by the bed the tall nurse asked me if i had any false teeth and said i had better put socks on as my feet might get cold the orderly did this and then they helped me on to the stretcher my head went back and i felt a strain on my neck the next second my head was lifted and a pillow put under it and they had moved me without altering the position of my arm i was surprised and pleased at that then a blanket was put over me and one of the orderlies said ready yes i said but suddenly realized he was talking to the other orderly i was lifted up and carried across the room out into the courtyard what a blazing sun i closed my eyes dump 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 the stretcher seemed to bob along with a regular rhythmic swaying then they turned a corner and i felt a slight nausea i opened my eyes the stretcher was put on a table i felt very high up the matron person appeared she was older than the nurses and had a chain with scissors dangling on the end of it she smiled and asked what kind of a wound it was then the orderlies looked at each other at some signal that i could not see and lifted me up and into the next room they held the stretcher up level with the operating table and helped me on to it i did some good right elbow work and got on easily as i did so i saw mr bevan sitting on a chair in his white overall his gloved hands quietly folded in his lap he said and did nothing again i felt immensely impressed by his competence reserving every ounce of energy waiting until these less masterful beings had got everything ready they took off the blanket and moved things behind then they put the rubber cup over my mouth and nose just breathe quite naturally said the doctor i shut my eyes just ordinary breaths that is very good said the voice quietly and reassuringly i felt a sort of sweet shudder all down my body i wanted to laugh then i let my body go a little it was no good bracing myself i opened my right hand and shut it just to show them i was not off yet the process of coming to was unpleasant and uninteresting i do not think i distinguished myself by any originality so will not attempt to describe it that was a long interminable day and my arm hurt a good deal in the afternoon i was told that i should be pleased to hear that there was no bone broken i was anything but pleased i wanted the bone to be broken as i wanted to go to blighty this worried me all day i wondered if i should get to england or not then in the evening the sister 
I found that the nurses should be called sisters, dressed the wound. That was distinctly unpleasant. It took hours and hours and hours before it began to get even twilight. I have never known so long a day. And then I could not sleep. They injected morphia at last, but I awoke after three or four hours, feeling more tired than ever. Thursday I can hardly disentangle these days. Night and day ran into one another. I can remember little about Thursday. I could not sleep, however much I wanted to, and all the time my brain was working so hard thinking. I worried about the company. They must be in the line now. Would Edwards remember this and that? Had I left him the map, or was it among those maps in my valise which Lewis had gone to Morlancourt to fetch? and all the time there were rifle-grenades about. I daren't let the buzzing come, because it was all rifle-grenades, really, and always I kept seeing Lance Corporal Allen lying there. Why could I not get rid of the picture of him? Yet I was afraid I might forget, and it was important that I should remember. I remember the waiting to have my arm dressed. It was like waiting before the dentist takes up the drill again. I watched the man next to me out of the corner of my eye, and felt it intensely if he seemed to wince or drew in his breath. And I remember in the morning Mr. Bevan dressed my wound. I looked the other way. For a week I thought the wound was above instead of just below the elbow. This will hurt, he said once. Some time in the day the man behind the screen died. I had heard him groaning all day and there was the rhythmic sound of pumping, oxygen, I suppose. I heard a lot of moving behind the screen, and at last it was taken away, and I saw the corner for the first time, and in it an empty bed with clean sheets. The man next to me, with the bandaged head, kept talking deliriously to the orderly about his being on a submarine. Once the orderly smiled at me as he answered the absurd questions. There was one good incident, I remember. After the surgeon had dressed my arm, I said, Is there any chance of this getting me to Blighty? And I thought he did not hear. He was looking the other way. But suddenly I heard that calm, deliberate voice. Yes, this is a Blighty one. There is enough damage to those muscles to keep you in Blighty several months. And this made all the rest bearable somehow. FRIDAY Again the only sleep I could get was by morphia. In the morning they told me I should go by a hospital train, leaving at three o'clock. I scrawled a note or two and gave them to Lewis, and instructed him about my kit. I believe they made an inventory of it. I gave him some maps for Edwards, and then he said good-bye. And I thought of him going back, and I going to England. And I felt ashamed of myself again. I wondered if the Colonel was annoyed with me. They gave me gas in the morning. It seemed such a bother going through all that again. It was not worth trying to get better. Still, I was glad. It was one dressing less. Then in the afternoon I was carried on a stretcher to the train. I hardly saw anyone to say good-bye to. I thought of writing later. It seemed an interminable journey. By some mistake I had been put in with the Tommies. There was no difference in the structure or comfort of the officers or Tommy's quarters. But I knew they were taking me wrong. However, I was entirely passive, and did not mind what they did. The carriage had a corridor all the way down the centre, and on each side was a succession of berths in three tiers. On the top tier you must have felt very high and close up to the roof. On the centre one you got a good view out of the windows. On the third and lowest tier which was my lot, you felt that if there were an accident you would not have far to roll. On the other hand, you were out of view of orderlies passing along the corridor. A great thirst consumed me as I lay waiting. I could see two orderlies in the space by the door cutting up large pieces of bread and butter. This made my mouth still drier. Then they brought in cans of hot tea, and gave it out in white enamel bowls. I longed for the sting of the tea on my dry palate, but the orderly was startled when I said, I suppose this is all right, I am an officer. He said he would tell them, and gave the bowl to the next man. The bowls were taken away and washed up, 
before a cup of tea was at last brought me a corporal brought it he poured it out of a little teapot but i could not drink it out of a cup my left arm lay like a log beside me and i could not hold my right arm steady and raise my head so the corporal went off for a feeding cup i felt rather nervy and like a man with a grievance and when i got the tea it was nearly cold i say it seemed an interminable journey and my arm was so frightfully uncomfortable i had it across my body and felt i could not breathe for the weight of it at last i felt i must get its position altered i called orderly every time an orderly went past sometimes they paused and looked round but they could not see me and went on sometimes they did not hear anything i felt as self-conscious and irritated as a man who calls waiter and the waiter does not hear at last one heard and a sister came and fixed me up with a small pillow under the elbow i immediately felt apologetic and i wondered if she thought me fussy the train made a long slow grind over the rails and it kept stopping with a grinding sound and a jolt why did it go so slowly at ten o'clock i begged and obtained another morphia dose and got four hours sleep from it again saturday i suppose it was about seven a m when we arrived at etretat i was taken and laid in the middle of rows and rows of tommies in a big sunny courtyard i thought how well the bearers carried the stretchers i did not at all feel that i was likely to be dropped or tilted off on to my arm there were a lot of men in blue hospital dress on the steps of a big house i wondered where i was in havre probably it was a queer sensation lying on my back gazing up at the sun we were tightly packed in together like cards laid in order face upwards how high every one looked standing up then they discovered one or two officers and i said that i too was an officer i felt that they rather dared me to repeat this statement then a man looked at my label and said yes he is an officer and i was taken up and carried off i found myself put to bed in a spacious room in which were only two beds the house had only recently been finished and was in use as a hospital as soon as i was in bed i felt a great relief again no more motion for a time i thought there was a man in the other bed threatened with consumption we were talking when a pretty v a d nurse came in and asked what we wanted for breakfast i felt quite hungry and enjoyed tea and fish i began to think that life was going to be good i saw cecil todd who had been slightly wounded a fortnight ago i condoled with him on not getting to england he asked me if i wanted to read no i did not feel like reading i wrote a letter then two v a d nurses came and dressed my wound they seemed surprised to find so big a one and sent for the doctor to see it they dressed it very well and gave me no unnecessary pain in the afternoon i was again moved to a motor ambulance which took me to havre it jolted and shook horribly this man does not know what it is like up here i thought all the time i was straining my body to keep the left arm from touching the jolting stretcher the stretchers slide in the ambulance i was a top berth passenger i could touch the white roof with my right hand and there was a stuffy smell of white paint at last it stopped and after a while i was carried amid a sea of heads along a quay i could smell sea and the stale oily smell of a steamer then i was taken over the gangway with that firm steady nodding motion with which i was getting so familiar along the deck through doorways and into a big room all green and white all round the edge were beds into one of which i was helped in the centre of the room were beds that somehow reminded me of cots i dare say there was a low railing round the beds that gave me this impression a scotch nurse looked after me these nurses were all in grey and red the others had been in blue i wondered what was the difference i asked the name of the ship and they said it was the asturias later on a steward brought a menu and i chose my own dinner apparently i could eat what i liked the doctor looked at my wound and said it could wait until morning before being dressed he pleased me i was more comfortable than i had been yet 
the boat was not due out till about 1 a.m. At eleven o'clock I again asked for morphia, and so got sleep for another four hours or so. SUNDAY I represent Messrs. Cox and Company. Is there anything I can do for any of you gentlemen this morning? A short, squarely built man, with a black suit, a bowler hat, and a small brown bag, stepped briskly into the room. He gave me intense pleasure. As he talked to a Scotch officer who wanted some ready cash, I felt that I was indeed back in England. It was a hot sunny day, and a bowler hat on such a day made me feel sure that this was really Southampton, and not all a dream. Sir, whoever you are, I thank you for your most appropriate appearance. The hospital ship had been alongside nearly an hour, I believe. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. Breakfast, the dressing of my wound again, lunch, all had followed in an uneventful succession. The throbbing of the engines as the boat steamed quietly along had been hardly noticeable at all. At last there was a bustle, and we were carried out of the room, out into the sunshine again, and along the quay to the train. Here I was given a berth in the middle tier this time, for which I was very thankful. I felt so utterly tired, and the weight of my arm across my body was intolerable. That seemed a long, long journey, too. But I got tea without delay this time, and it was hot. At Farnborough the train stopped, and a few men were taken out. The rest came on to London. "'Is there any special hospital in London you want to go to?' said a brisk R.A.M.C. official, when we reached Waterloo. "'No,' I answered. He wrote on a label, and put that round my neck also. "'Lady Carnavons,' he said. I lay for some time on the platform of Waterloo Station, gazing up at the vault in the roof. Porters and stretcher-bearers stood about, and gazed down at one in silence. Then I was moved into a motor ambulance, and a Red Cross lady took her seat in the back. My head was in the front, so that I could see nothing. Just before the car went off, a policeman put his head in. "'Any milk or anything?' "'Would you like any milk or beef tea?' the lady said. "'Milk, please.' "'He says he would like a little milk,' said the lady. And then we drove off. MONDAY It was somewhere about ten o'clock Monday morning. The sister had just finished dressing my arm. The doctor had poked it about. Now it lay cool and quiet along by my side. I had not slept that night again, except with morphia. I still felt extraordinarily tired, but was very comfortable. I watched the tall sister in blue, with the white headdress that reminded me of a nun's cap. She was so strong and quiet, and seemed to know that my hand always wanted support at the wrist when she lifted my arm. I did not want to talk just to lie. Suddenly I realized that my head was no longer buzzing. I knew that I should sleep to-night, at last. My body relaxed, the tension suddenly melted away. Hurrah! I thought. I have not got to move, or think, or decide, and I can just lie for hours, for days. At last I was out of the grip of war. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Nothing of Importance by Bernard Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Conclusion It was a slumberous afternoon in September. My wound had healed up a month ago, and I was lazily convalescent at my aunt's house in one of the most beautiful parts of Kent. The six soldiers who were also convalescent there were down in the hop garden for hop-picking was in full swing. I was sitting in a deck-chair with Don Quixote on my knees, but I was not reading. I had apparently broken the offensive power of the army of midges by making a brilliant counter-attack with a pipe of chairman. The sun blazed mercilessly on the croquet lawn. The balls were lying all together round one hoop, for there was a golf croquet tournament in progress, and the mallets stood about against various hoops. One very tidy and proper mallet was standing primly in the stand at one corner. 
my chair was well sighted under the cool shade of a large mulberry tree in whose thick lofty branches the wind rustled with a delicious little sigh sometimes a regular little gust would send the boughs swishing and then a little rain of red and white mulberries would plop on to the grass and strike the summer-house roof with a smart patter on the grass bank at the side of the lawn by a blazing border of orange and red nasturtiums a black cat was squatting with tail slowly waving to and fro watching a fine large tabby that was sniffing at the nasturtiums in a nonchalant manner they were the best of friends playing that most interesting of all games war i was not reading i was listening to the incessant murmur that came from far away across the medway across the garden of england and across the channel and the flats of flanders that sound came from picardy all day the insistent throb had been in the air sometimes faint bumps were clearly distinguishable at other times it was nothing but one steady vibration but always it was there that distant growl that insistent mutter even in this perfect peace i could not escape the war to-day i felt completely well the lassitude and inertness of convalescence were gone at any rate for the moment my mind was very clear and i could think surely and rapidly the cats reminded me of the lusty family that lived in the cellar in the quinchy trenches and the murmur of the guns drew my thoughts across the channel i tried to imagine trenches running across the lawn with communication trenches running back to a support line through the meadow a few feet of brick wall would be all that would be left of the house and this would conceal my snipers the mulberry tree would long ago have been raised to the ground and every scrap of it used as firewood in our dugouts this deck chair of mine might possibly be in use in company headquarters in one of the cellars no it was not easy to imagine war without seeing it i picked up the paper that had fallen by my side there had been more terrible fighting in the psalm and it had seemed very marvellous to a journalist as he lay on a hill some two miles back and watched through his field-glasses it was wonderful that the men advancing if indeed he could really see them at all in the smoke of a heavy artillery barrage still went on although their comrades dropped all round them yet i wondered what else any one could do but go on run back with just as much likelihood of being shot in doing so or even if he did get back to certain death as a deserter every one knows the safest place is in a trench and it is a trench you are making for lower down on the page came a description of the wounded he had talked to so many of them and they were all smiling all so cheerful smoking cigarettes and laughing they shook their fists and shouted that the only thing they wanted to do was to get back into it pa i threw the paper down in disgust surely no one wants to read such stuff i thought of course the men who were not silent in a dull stupefied agony were smiling what need to say that a man with a slight wound was laughing at his luck just as i had smiled that early morning when the trolley took me down from maple redoubt and who does not volunteer for an unpleasant task when he knows he cannot possibly get it want to get back into it indeed ask tommy ten years hence whether he wants to be back in the middle of it again i wondered why people endured such cheap journalism what right had men who have never seen war at all who creep up on bicycles to get a glimpse of it through telescopes who pester wounded men and then out of their pictorial imagination work up a vivid description what right have they to insult heroes by saying that their wonderful spirit makes up for it all that the paramount impression is one of glory are not our people able to bear the truth that war is utterly hellish that we do not enjoy it that we hate it hate it hate it and then it struck me how ignorant people still were how uncertainly they spoke these people at home it was as though they dared not think things out lest what they held most dear should be an image shattered by another point of view somehow people were amazed at the cheerfulness the doggedness the endurance under pain the indifference to death shown every minute during this war i thought of the men whom i had seen in hospital 
One man had had his right foot amputated. It used to give me agony to see his stump dressed every day. Another man had both legs amputated above the knees. Yet they were so wonderfully cheerful, so apparently content with life. As though alone in the blackness of night, they did not long for the activity denied them for the rest of their life. As though their cheerfulness, do not think I belittle its heroism, as though their cheerfulness justified the thing. Another thing I had noticed. An old man told me he was so struck with the heroism, the courage, the indifference to death, shown by the ordinary unromantic man. Some men had been converted, too, their whole lives changed, their vices eradicated by this war. So much good was coming from it. People, too, at home were so changed, so sobered. They were looking into the selfishness of their lives at last. Again, I thought, as though all that justified the thing. Oh, you men and women who did not know before the capabilities of human nature, I thought, please take note of it now, and after the war do not underestimate the quality of mankind. Did it need a war to tell you that a man can be heroic, resolute, courageous, cheerful, and capable of sacrifice? There were those who could have told you that before this war. There was a lull in the vibration. I turned in my chair and listened. Then it began again. "'People are afraid to think it out,' I said. "'I have not seen the Somme fighting, but I know what war is. Its quality is not altered by multiplication or intensity. The colour of life-blood is a constant red. Let us look into this business. Let us face all the facts. Let us not flinch from any aspect of the truth.' And my thoughts ran somewhat as follows. First of all, war is evil utterly evil. Let us be sure of that first. It is an evil instrument, even if it be used for motives that are good. I, who have been through war and know it, say that it is evil. I knew it before the war. Instinct, reason, religion told me that war was evil. Now experience has told me also. It is a strange synthesis, this war. It is a synthesis of adventure, dullness, good spirits, and tragedy but none of these things are new to human experience, nor is human nature altered by war. It is at war as a whole that we must look in order to appreciate its quality. And what is war seen as a whole, or rather seen in the light of my eight months' experience? For no one man can truly appraise war. I have seen and felt the adventure of war, its deadly fascination and excitement. It is the greatest game on earth that is its terrible power. There is such a wild temptation to paint up its interest and glamour. It gives such scope to daring, to physical courage, to high spirits. It makes so many prove themselves heroic, that were it not for the fall of the arrow, men would call the drawing of the bow good. I have seen the dullness, the endless monotony, the dogged labour, the sheer power of will conquering the body and carrying on. There is good in that, too. In the jollity, the humour, the good fellowship, is nothing but good also. There is good in all these things, for these are qualities of human nature triumphing in spite of war. These things are not war. They are the good in man, prostituted to a vile thing. For I have seen the real face of war. I have seen men killed, mutilated, blown to pieces. I have seen men crippled for life. I have looked in the face of madness, and I know that many have gone mad under its grip. I have seen fine natures break and crumble under the strain. I have seen men grow brutalized and coarsened in this war. God will judge justly in the end, meanwhile. There are thousands among us, yes, and among our enemy too, brutalized through no fault of theirs. I have lost friends killed, and shall lose more yet friends with whom I have lived and suffered so long. Who is for war now? Its adventure, its heroism? Bah! Yet this is not all. For war spares none. It desecrates the beauty of the earth. It ruins, it destroys, it wastes. It starves children. It drives out old men and women homeless. And most terrible of all, it brings agony to every household. It is like a plague of the firstborn, do not think I have forgotten you, O women and old men. 
you too have to endure the agony of the arena and you are compelled to sit and watch us fight the beasts every mother is there in agony watching her baby and unable to stretch a finger to help this too is war the anguish of mothers whose sons perish of wives who lose their husbands of girls robbed for all time of marriage and motherhood and this vile thing is still perpetrated upon the earth among peoples who have long ago declared human sacrifice impossible and barbaric this then is a basal fact we have faced it fairly the instrument is vile what then of the motive what is the motive which drives us to use this evil instrument and i see you fathers and mothers waiting to hear what i shall say for there are people who whisper that we who are fighting are vindictive that we lust for the blood of our enemies that we are coarse and brutal that we are unholy champions of what we call a just cause again let us face the facts and to these whisperers i answer boldly yes we are coarse some of us we are vindictive we hate we do not deny it for war in its vileness taints its human instruments too when davidson died i cried death upon his murderers i called them devils and worse i am not ashamed that is not the point what i or tommy may be at a given moment is not the point the question is with what motives did we enter this war agree to take up this vile instrument we cannot help it if it soils our hands what is our motive in fighting in the arena what provokes the dumb heroism of our soldiers why did men flock to the colours volunteer in millions for the arena you know i who have lived with them eight months in france i also know it was because a people took up this vile instrument and used it from desire of power because they trampled on justice and challenged us to thwart them because they willed war for the sake of wrong because they said that force was master of the world and they set out to prove it yet it is sometimes said war is unchristian if men were christian there would be no war you cannot conquer evil by evil i agree if men were christian there would be no war i agree that you cannot conquer evil by evil but it is war that is evil not our motive in going to war we are conquering an evil spirit by a good spirit even if we are using an evil instrument and if you say that christ would not fight i say that none of us would fight if the world had attained the christian plane towards which we are slowly rising but we are still on a lower plane and in it there is a big war raging and in the arena there are many who have felt christ by their side that then is the second point i knew that war was vile before i went into it i have seen it i do not alter my opinion i went into this war prepared to sacrifice my life to prove that right is stronger than wrong i have stood again and again with a traverse between me and death i have faced the possibility of madness i foresaw all this before i went into this war what difference does it make that i have experienced it it makes no difference let no one fear that our sacrifice has been in vain we have already won what we are fighting for the will for war that aggressive power with all the cards on its side prepared striking at its own moment has already failed against a spirit weaker unprepared taken unawares and so i am clear on my second point we are fighting from just motives and we have already balked in justice aggressive force the power that took up the cruel weapon of war has failed no one can ever say that his countrymen have laid down their lives in vain i got up from the chair and started walking about the garden everything was so clear before going out to the war i had thought these things but the thoughts were fluid they ran about in mazy patterns they were elusive and always i was frightened of meeting unanswerable contradictions to my theorizing from men who had actually seen war now my conclusions seemed crystallized by irrefutable experience into solid truth after a while i sat down again and resumed my train of thought war is evil justice is stronger than force yet was there need of all this bloodshed to prove this 
for this war is not as past wars this is every man's war a war of civilians a war of men who hate war of men who fight for a cause who are compelled to kill and hate it that is another thing that people will not face men whisper that tommy does not hate fritz again i say away with this whispering let us speak it out plain and bold private davies my orderly formerly a shepherd of blaignau festignog has no quarrel with one fritz schneider of hamburg who is sitting in the trench opposite the matterhorn sap yet he will bayonet him certainly if he comes over the top or if we go over into the german trenches i he will perform this action with a certain amount of brutality too for i have watched him jabbing at rats with a bayonet through the wires of a rat trap and i know that he has in him a savage vein of cruelty but when peace is declared he and fritz will light a bonfire of trench stores in no man's land and there will be the end of their quarrel i say boldly i know for indeed i know davies very well indeed again i say was there need of all this bloodshed who is responsible who is responsible for lance corporal allen lying in the trench in maple redoubt again i see yon glittering eyes looking down upon me in the arena and davies too in his slow simple way is beginning to take you in and to ask you why is he put there to fight is it for your pleasure is it for your expediency is it a necessary part of your great game necessary necessary for whom davies and fritz alike are awaiting your answer it is hard to trace ultimate causes it is hard to fix absolute responsibility there were many seeds sown scattered and secretly fostered before they produced this harvest of blood the seeds of cruelty selfishness ambition avarice and indifference are always liable to swell grow and bud and blossom suddenly into the red flower of war let every man look into his heart, and if the seeds are there, let him make quick to root them out while there is time, unless he wishes to join those glittering eyes that look down upon the arena. These are the seeds of war, and it is because they know that we, too, are not free from them, that certain men have stood out from the arena as a protest against war. These men are real heroes, who for their conscience's sake are enduring taunts ignominy misunderstanding and worse most men and women in the arena are cursing them and as they struggle in agony and anguish they beat their hands at them and cry you do not care i too have cursed them when i was mad with pain but i know them and i know that they are true men i would not have one less they are witnesses against war and i too am fighting war men do not understand them now but one day they will i know that there are among us too the seeds of war no cause has yet been perfect but i look at the facts we did not start we did not want this war we have gone into it fighting for the better cause whether had we been more christian we might have prevented the war is not the point we did not want this war we are fighting against it it was the seeds of war in germany that were responsible and so history will judge but what of the future how are we to save future generations from going down into the arena we will rearrange the map of europe we will secure the independence of small states we will give the power to the people there shall be an end of tyrannies so men speak easily of an international spirit of a world conference for peace there is so great a will-power against war they say that we will secure the world for the future millions of men know the vileness of war they will devise ways and means to prevent its recurrence i agree let us try all ways yet i see no guarantee in all this against the glittering eyes i see no power in all this knowledge against a new generation fostering and harvesting the seeds of war men have long known that war is evil did that knowledge prevent this war will that knowledge secure india or china from the power of the glittering eyes i walked up and down the lawn my eyes glowing my brain working hard 
here around me was all the beauty of an old garden its long borders full of phloxes delphiniums stocks and all the old familiar flowers the apples glowed red in the trees the swallows were skimming across the lawn in the distance i could hear the rumble of the wagon bringing up the afternoon load of hop pokes to the oast house yet what i had seen of war was as true had as really happened as all this it would be so easy to forget after the war and yet to forget might mean a seed of war i must never forget lance corporal allen there is only one sure way i said at last and again a clear conviction filled me there is only one way to put an end to the arena pledges and treaties have failed and force will fail these things may bring peace for a time but they cannot crush those glittering eyes there is only one man whose eyes have never glittered look at the palms of your hands you who have had a bullet through the middle of it did they not give you morphia to ease the pain and did you not often cry out alone in the darkness in the terrible agony that you did not care who won the war if only the pain would cease yet one man there was who held out his hand upon the wood while they knocked 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 in the nail every knock bringing a jarring excruciating pain every bit as bad as yours and any moment his will-power could have weakened and he could have saved himself that awful pain and then they nailed through the other hand and then the feet and as they lifted the cross all the weight came upon the pierced hands and when he had tasted the vinegar he would not drink, and any moment he could have come down from the cross, yet he so cared that love should win the war against evil, that he never wavered, his eyes never glittered. Do you want to put an end to the arena? Here is a man to follow. In hoc signo vinces. I stood up again, and stretched out my hands, and as I did so, a memory came back vivid and strong. I remembered the night when I stood out on the hillside by Trafalgar Square, under the moon, and I remembered how I felt a strength out of the pain, and even as the strength came, a more unutterable weakness, the weakness of a man battering against a wall of steel. The sound of the relentless guns had mocked at me. Now as I stood on the lawn, I heard the long, continuous vibration of the guns upon the psalm. "'You are war,' I said aloud this is your hour the power of darkness but the time will come when we shall follow the man who has conquered your last weapon death and then your walls of steel will waver cringe and fall melted away before the fire of love end of chapter seventeen end of nothing of importance by bernard adams recording by lee smalley